I say, but uh, with all these, with you're so busy in the port of call. I know you enjoyed uh, his last couple of uh, talks, and today he's putting himself in the hot seat, so to speak, the spotlight. What questions do you have? Anything? Think of anything that you can think of. And uh, this man is well. He'll debate about it. He'll talk about it. He really is putting himself, and in brackets, it is dangerous. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Mr. Brian J. Ford. Thank you, Gary, very much. Like the knees. Yes, I may say, several people have pointed to the fact that here I was in my suit, and not so long ago I was flopping about upstairs in medical shorts, but uh, I thought they would detract from the dignity of the situation, and therefore dug out my suit and dusted it off and took out every mothball. Now, have any of you ever seen a virile, uh, muscled, healthy young man hang gliding over the cone of an erupting volcano whilst wearing nothing but inflammable underpants? <laughs> no? Well, this afternoon is as close as you're going to get because this is the most dangerous thing I ever do. And several people have come up and said, tell me what I'd like to hear you speak about. It's... And I say, no, 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 don't mention. It only works if I haven't the slightest clue what's coming up. And so really, this is my, one of my programmes, only it's sort of live and done with a live audience who can respond, rather than simply turning off, which they can do quietly at home without you knowing. So, let's start. I would mention, by the way, that uh, we had a load of my books on board, which all were sold, enough for the two cruises. And they've all, there's just a couple left in the shop. And those who get them, I will be very happy to sign them. And in spite of what the prices say, they're all at ten weeks. There's only, I think, two or three left. I'm sorry about that, but I was assured by one of the autumn directors that if a box got across to the office by Friday, that it could come out on the charter flight and be here for the beginning of this cruise. And although it got there on the Thursday, we had a message to say, awfully sorry, we can't do it in time. Which is typical of the high-speed efficiency you find in cruise offices when you really get down to it. Uh, Gary asked a question the other evening about the extinction of the dinosaurs. And indeed, they're almost all extinct. Just a few remain in senior management. So, so where are we going to start? Who would like to propose a topic or ask a question? Uh, yes, madam. <laughs> Well, this, that's a very good question. It's all about sulfur and rotorua and uh, hydrogen sulfide being poisonous, coupled with why you were made to eat sulfur as a child. Sulfur, uh, a brimstone and treacle, sulfur mixed with, with syrup. Firstly, sulfur itself isn't dangerous. Sulfur is a yellow powder, an element. And if you mix sulfur with treacle, which simply makes it tasty, then you can indeed take sulfur. And sulfur has had a number of effects against microbes. It used to be an ancient treatment. So sulfur itself is fine. But of course that sulfur is an element, and once it's combined into a, into a, a compound, then it's totally different. After all, sodium chloride, the salt that we sprinkle on our chips, is made from a highly explosive metal coupled with a deadly poisonous gas. And on their own, they're very dangerous, but combined together they form salt, which is a completely different substance. And hydrogen sulfide is active, very active, against the lining of the lungs. And as an industrial gas, the levels of hydrogen sulfide are, I think, just about as low as those for, for cyanide in a factory exposure environment. So, yes, if you go to visit places like Rotorua or Sulfatara, Yellowstone, wherever else where there are sulfurous vapors, then no, of course it doesn't do you any harm because you're only there for a short while. But living in that environment is not a good idea. And indeed, living in that environment often kills off plants in the district as well. So if you go, then go with good heart, but don't move into a little wooden chalet just downwind of the main sulphur spring, believing that all that egg-smelling sulphurous gas is going to do you good. It won't. It'll do you harm. But sulphur itself, pure yellow sulphur, has long been used as a medicine, and your dad would have done you no harm at all by doing it, I promise. <laughs> ah, he didn't take any, she says. Well, that's true, but, but I mean, people in authority are there to enforce rules, not necessarily to follow them. Let's have another hand. Please. I've, um, I've seen some of those uh, interesting uh, photographs. And they say, look, there's two shadows. All the reflection's wrong. Well, you do get all sorts of dodgy things happening in photographs. And none of the examples that I've seen have convinced me that 
they didn't go to the moon. I mean, they, they did. They got in a rocket. I, I was once a guest of NASA and saw a, uh, a shuttle blast off when Sally Ride went up into space. And it was it, the most exciting sort of space, well, apart from flying on Concorde, the most exciting thing I've ever done because you sit in this VIP stand looking out over the Apollo launch pad and suddenly it, it bursts. It's like a dazzling magnesium flame. This is a sunlit day, ladies and gentlemen. The sun is blazing in the sky, and this seems brighter. This is the most phenomenally dazzling sight you see. And then, a second or two later, the sound hits you, and you don't hear it as a sound. There's a crackle, and your chest rattles, and everybody coughs because the phlegm gets knocked about in their lungs. And up goes this colossal thing, with everything juddering around you, all the stand and the chairs that you're sitting on, everything is, is juddering. Uh, and up it goes. And uh, yes, of, of course they did. And they would never have pretended they didn't because they knew that the Russians were hard on their tail and the Chinese were wanting to be hard on their tail and might well turn up shortly. They had no means of knowing whether they would. And had they based the whole of their international reputation on the moon landing and the others had got there and found it was a fake, then nobody would have believed in Africa ever again. So it's a, one of those nice conspiracy theories, but no, I don't think it's true, and yes, I do think they can. Please. Yes. In the center, the sun is really a, a sort of hydrogen bomb, and in the outside, it's really an atom bomb. In the hydrogen bomb, you've got molecules that fuse together and create tremendous energy. In the atom bomb, you've got molecules that split apart and create enormous energy. And what you've got uh, in the sun, I may say it the wrong way around, is an atom bomb in the core surrounded by a layer of hydrogen bomb. So the splitting atoms in the middle form light atoms that then fuse at the surface. The surface of the sun, by the way, is not that hot. Uh, two, or th two or three thousand degrees Celsius. It isn't really very hot. We've got lots of hotter temperatures on Earth. The temperature of the spark from a sparkler is hotter than the temperature of the surface of the sun. But the sun is really like a self-fueling self system of nuclear bombs. And it's important to remember they are nuclear bombs, because when you lie in the sun and you've not been exposed to the sun, you, your skin isn't used to it, and you burn and you get sometimes red on your chest, and you may end up with blisters, what you've got is radiation burns. And the people in Hiroshima suffered exactly the same when the bomb went off. Did you hear about the man who went to see his doctor? And he said, he said, it's a very silly thing. He said, but I fell asleep while sunbathing. And the whole of my body is red raw. Can you give me anything for it? And the doctor said, only Viagra. Viagra, said the man, indeed. He said, it'll keep the sheets off you when you sleep. <laughs> what a saucy laugh. Goodness me. Right, let's have another. Yes, sir. No, he didn't. No, he asked whether well, I thought they had. Well, the time travel, no, I don't think so, because it's intuitive that time goes forward, and I'm just too simple-minded to understand it any other way. And I've had some very, as Harold, Harold Wilson used to call them, full-frank discussions with the Astronomer Royal about that. He believes in parallel universes and all this old nonsense, and I think, well, you've written some jolly good books, Arnold, and they're awfully well written, but it's a load of Coswell, if you ask me. Yeah. However, having said that, the other question about, you know, beam me up Scotty is what you're really wondering about, isn't it? And the reason it's unlikely to work is because of Einstein's theory of E equals mc squared. E, energy, equals mass multiplied by the square of the speed of light. In other words, um, a, an amount of mass is equal to a vast amount of energy. Now, it would simply take far too much energy ever to convert mass into energy and then transport it. You know far more than all the world's electricity generation put together to transport, as it were, a, a cube of sugar over the space of five weeks. I mean, it, it, it's of that order. So with our present understanding, no, I don't think so. So the answer to your question is twofold. The first is, no, I don't think time travel will ever take place, and I've always thought it's complete drivel. Indeed, the proof, the scientific proof, I would offer all of you is that a man from the future is not going to walk in there and say, ha ha, you were wrong. If he does, then I'll believe it. But nobody has ever come back from the future. And so for uh, that reason, no, I don't think so. 
And so far as will people ever make matter transfer instantaneously, well, within the present state of physics, no, we can't. But then, when we were little, radios had valves. Now you can have an entire full-color 625-line television recording system in the back of your camcorder smaller than a box of Swan Vesta's matches. So if we've seen such amazing things in our own lifetime, I won't predict about the future. So no, I don't think time travel will ever happen, but who knows, one day there might be the matter transfer. It'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it, than sitting in a plane. Just imagine you turn up a Barbados, stand in a capsule, press the button, bingo, hello, Gran. Let's see, another one. Yeah. Um, the question of matter being indestructible is rather like energy all coming from the sun. Matter is to all intents and purposes indestructible. But when you fire an atomic weapon, you do destroy matter and produce energy. And the produced energy, of course, is the crater that uh, forms the crater that, uh, that, that is there. It's like, you know, all energy comes from the sun. Yes, all energy does come from the sun in terms of thermal energy and solar energy and wind energy and so forth. But also energy comes from the heat beneath our feet. And people do sometimes make these general overview statements, and you're quite you're very wise to pick up on that one, like, you know, matter is always indestructible and all energy comes from the sun, because there are teensy exceptions which always make things interesting. So yes, you can destroy matter, but only by converting it into energy, and it doesn't usually happen. Quantum, the answer to can I explain simply what quantum means is no. Next question, please. But, 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 and this is the important, a quantum is the notion of there being an indivisible sort of atom of energy. Until the time of Democritus, people began to think about the notion of, if you had a, a block of matter and you cut it in half and in half and in half and in half, and you went on forever, Democritus realized, before the time of Christ, that there must come a time when you can't divide anything anymore. We talked about sulfur as an element earlier. He said there must be an ultimate particle of sulfur which you can't divide anymore and it's still is sulfur. And that was his notion of the atom. And it was the English scientist Dalton who coined the notion of the atom and began to draw up a list of all the atoms and how they actually work. Well, light has always been regarded as being just a form of energy. But by the same logic, people thought you can't have less and less and less and less and less light until there's nothing left. So the idea then formed that the smallest bit of light you could have would be, like an atom of light, a photon. And that is a quantum particle. And the quantum theories are really based on the notion that there are tiny bits of energy, smaller than which you could never go. And they did make a tremendous revolution to the way that we thought. We thought of energy as being sort of subdivisible, but only to a certain extent. Whereas people had always thought of energy as being rather like a dimmer switch, anything from full on to full off. But now we realize there must be a bit that you can't go smaller than and still call it energy, and that's what the quantum really is. So. Oh, what a bloody good question that was. Thank you for that one. Might we ever exceed the speed of light? The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, which is dead fast, considerably faster than this noble ship. And you do get people who have wondered whether you could go faster than the speed of light. So far, there isn't any evidence of the speed of light ever being exceeded. But there is a young physicist at Cambridge, whose name escapes me, who recently wrote a book, and who has been studying the notion that the speed of light varies. Now, we've always known of the speed of light as a constant. E equals mc squared. I mentioned earlier Einstein's theory. E equals mc squared, c being the speed of light, it was regarded as a fixed constant. The speed of light was an absolutely unchangeable permanent figure that would never ever alter no matter what happened. And this chap is saying, well, we don't know that's the case. People have measured the speed of light where it is, but sometimes it might go a bit slower or a bit faster. And possibly we could explain the universe differently if we regarded the speed of light as being changeable rather than permanent. So the answer to the question is that I don't think we ever will travel faster than light, and without going into Newtonian relativity, there are reasons why one wouldn't. But the speed of light may not be constant. And this really is a watch this space, because we were all told 
that the speed of light was constant when we were kiddies, and the fact that it might actually change is an interesting and very new thought. It's only been arisen in the last few years. So I congratulate you on that. It's a nice question. So, this is like the question posed by Thomas Malthus in the 1700s. The notion that with the world's population increasing exponentially, we will use up all our resources and be stuck with nothing. Malthus looked at it in terms of food production. And I think the answer is no. Firstly, because the world's population is not exceeding, is not mushrooming in the way we think it is. The world's population has certainly been increasing dramatically. It'll go up by a billion in a couple of decades. I mean, it's an extraordinary rate of increase. But in the civilized countries, the rate of increase goes down to almost zero. In some countries in the West, the rate of increase of the population has gone down to nothing and is even slightly negative because people are having fewer children than they need to replace the people who die. So it is not inevitable that the world's population will mushroom. The reason people have lots of children in poor countries is because the children are all they have. They need children to work on the farm and to nurture them when they're old. And they have children as insurance because the children are the only thing that they can ever get. But once people have washing machines and tape recorders and video cameras and clothes washers and tumble dryers and televisions and cars, they then begin to see children as more of a hindrance and therefore have fewer. So the more civilized a society, the lower its birth rate. Now that, of course, is potentially an upsetting demographic because it means that the poor countries will mushroom and overtake, in terms of numbers, the richer Western countries. But, but that is an important point, that the world's population may not always increase. And if you look forward, say, 100 years, when everybody's earning the sort of wages we do, then it may well be the world's population will have stabilised for that reason alone. But what Thomas Malthus wondered about, and it's inherent in your question, was the notion of whether we have so many mouths we couldn't feed them all. And ever since the Second World War, dig for Britain and grow food and people having allotments, we have been striving to produce enough food. Britain has been longing to become self-sufficient in agricultural output. And round about the 1980s, we did it. Early 90s. Round about 1990, we did it. There should have been banners, headlines, campaigns, television programs, street parties. Instead, <coughs> excuse me, because we were now producing too much food, Brussels introduced set aside. And you now pay farmers hundreds of thousands of pounds, which they greatly dislike, growing a crop, say, of wheat, and then burning it all off with glyphosate in the spring, and having a dead field, because there's too much food. And at the moment, there is no shortage of food in the world. There is more than enough food produced every year for everybody in the world to eat a good, solid diet. The only thing there is a shortage of is international goodwill. And the reason, for example, that food never got to the starving people in Eritrea during the famine of 1992 that Michael Burke, a friend of mine, um, reported so eloquently, was not because there was a lack of food in Ethiopia. Ethiopia at that time, believe it or not, was exporting grain, <coughs> homegrown grain. They were also importing large amounts of whiskey for the ruling classes. But what had happened was that Eritrea, their, their northern province, uh, striving for independence, and therefore they would not issue any passport documents for people to go into Eritrea, which is why the people were starving. And that meant when Bob Geldof's lorries turned up, they couldn't go in either. Eventually, of course, they managed it just by the Red Cross and international blackmail. But it is not a lack of food that causes many of the world's famines. It's just a lack of goodwill. And we are now in that triumphant position of producing quite enough food to feed everybody. The Chinese, in particular, in the last 20 years, have hugely increased their rate of food production. The most extraordinary scientific success we've ever seen. And um, with GM crops and things coming, and of course everything is going to change a great deal. But the Chinese have already shown how they are now producing far, far more food per capita than they were. So the, the situation is complicated and, di and difficult. And yes, if we're wasteful, we will run short of raw resources, and they will become very expensive. But no, I think when we start to run out of, say, silver, people will be recycling it more, what they do recycle silver now for. And they will be digging into our landfill sites, possibly within the lifetime of your grandchildren. They'll be mining our landfills to get back up the cadmium and all the other rare metals that they need, which we just chucked into discarded quarries. And they will get it back. So no, I don't think it's a long-term problem. Just at the moment, we're living in an era when 
the poor countries are very poor, that are producing things from woven bread baskets through to computers at terribly low cost. Uh, I was in China recently and they were celebrating the fact that 90% of the Chinese population is now above the poverty line. What they don't tell you though is that the poverty line is an income of 50 US dollars per year because one dollar a week is enough for basic food and rice and housing in China. I mean, these people are very, very poor. And we, with our very cheap computers and all the things that they make in those poor countries, we're living on their backs. They're, they're as it were, our slaves, but they're around the other side of the world. But in a hundred years' time, they will be earning wages the same as us. And all that will be different. So the, the future of economics is going to be very, very interesting. Cheap things will be very much more expensive. There will be real prices in the future. But I don't think that running out of food, as Thomas Malthus and others predicted, will ever happen for the reasons that I mentioned. Man, sir, all right at the back, yes. The, that's a very good point. The question of AIDS in Africa. AIDS in Africa has been the most appalling event for that country. The spread of AIDS is largely heterosexual now rather than homosexual. And in some areas, in some countries in Central Africa, the proportion of fit young men who've been wiped out and mothers who've been infected and from them their babies is going to knock a third, a half out of the population. And this is a world war in terms of bombing going on in Africa. It is a huge problem and I'm glad you raised it because we don't hear enough about it. I've written a number of articles and papers on it myself and I'm always surprised at the letters I get from people who say, do you know, I heard about this on the telly, but I didn't really understand how bad it was. But AIDS is a special case. AIDS is an ancient disease of primates, which emerged into the human population and began to spread in the early 1980s. Indeed, I wrote the first ever chapter on AIDS for a popular book, which was published in 1984. And it's remarkable to think that just 20 years later, this sort of rare disease has spread right around the world. It does, of course, make a colossal difference to the morals and ethics of behavior. When we were kids, if we misbehaved ourselves as children or as students, you might end up with a dose of the clap. Now you end up with a death sentence, or a very likely death sentence. So the, the existence of AIDS has been an appalling burden on many people's attitudes. And in Africa, it is a, a killer disease which is killing society. So it is an enormous, overwhelming problem. But there is a, a, a further problem that I think you were implying, because you said such as AIDS, and I think you were thinking of other diseases too, weren't you? Like, for example, foul pox at the moment in the Far East. If any of you see the, this year's Encyclopedia Britannica yearbook, you will see a chapter from me in it. Look it up in the library. Don't buy one, it's too expensive. And uh, in that chapter, I have looked at many new diseases, because there is a view that diseases like foul, foul flu are just spreading more than they used to. But there are some actually new diseases. When you go to the supermarket, there's quite a good chance that there will be an organism called Campylobacter in the chicken that you buy. In 1984, which is not very long ago, Campylobacter was first identified and named. You have heard about E. coli 0157 and its devastating effects on people who are contaminated by it. E. coli 0157 arose in the spring of 1982. In the winter of 1981, it didn't exist. And E. coli picked up two genes from another organism, genes that allow it to make a very dangerous toxin. And so that is a new disease. So we've actually got new diseases arising. And meanwhile, we've got old diseases like tuberculosis re-emerging in resistant form. In America, they've got hundreds of people locked up in a sort of concentration camp hospital, taken away, no due process, they're just locked up because they've tested positive to TB and they will not be let out until they're neg uh, negative again because they are infected with a drug-resistant form of tuberculosis which could spread like uh, wildfire through societies. The Americans don't use BCG vaccination as we still do more often than not in England, though recently in years in England people have said there are problems with supplies and we don't do it anymore. But in future, mark my words, we'll be doing far more immunizations, not far less. Because air transportation means that disease germs can travel right around the world in a second. Just like happened with SARS. 
and we will need to be extra vigilant. Have you noticed, for example, that they give out those little disinfectant towels when you go into the restaurant? They didn't two years ago. But I wrote a chapter, a few magazine articles, pointing out that uh, Norwalk virus, which is the organism that causes these short-term outbreaks of gastroenteritis in cruise audiences, that, that uh, these, these viruses are spread by manual contact. And all the cruise ships in the last two years have started giving out hand wipes. That reason. So we're going to see a lot more of that happening over the next few years. People will become aware that there are new diseases waiting to get us around the corner. And we will have to be much more conscious of hygiene in the future than we've ever been in the past. No, GM crops are not harmful. GM technology is one of the most useful potential technologies we've ever had. It's just that it's been picked up by people like Monsanto, who are, well, let's think of a polite expression, um, money-grubbing idiots. That's as polite as I can get. And they thought to themselves, well, if we do this uh, GM, we can make seeds which will die out at the end of the, their growth period. So farmers can't keep the seeds, they'll have to keep buying from us. And we can tie it into a spray that will also sell them. So we'll corner the market, they'll have to come to us for our seed. They'll have to come to us for the spray. And in a few years' time, we'll have the whole of the agricultural seed supply locked into our little system. And won't it be great? No, of course it wasn't. The Americans didn't sort of notice it because Monsanto slipped it out into the food supply. The Brits did, and so did Europe, because we had things like bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE. So we were much more aware of the problems of nasty diseases coming from our food. But that actually is a stupid, thoughtless way of using GM technology. For example, the suicide gene that they use, which you will all have heard of, that kills off the seeds and stops the peasant farmer keeping some seed for next year, that's been made internationally illegal. That's all been banned. And so you mustn't think that it's still part of current technology. The governments of the world were horrified, so that's immediately to stop. But first of all, you have to understand the extent to which all our food has been enormously modified from the original. Yeah. Wheat, oats, rye, barley, bananas, pineapples, all of these things are nothing like the original plants they came from. Wheat, oats, barley and rye are new, not just new species, they're new genera, they're totally new plants created back in the Bronze Age by very clever plant breeders at that time in order to produce something that we wanted. Look at goldfish. Look at dogs, from the tiny chihuahua up to the Irish wolfhound. Extraordinary distortions of what wild dogs and wolves were ever like. We have done the most enormous amount of genetically modifying, through traditional means, for thousands and thousands of years. Did you know, for example, if you look at a wild boar, and compare that with a Gloucester old spot, you know, a, a conventional pig, a mod they don't look at all like the same animal. And that, of course, is done by modifying them over thousands of years. And pigs actually began about eight and a half thousand years ago in what is now Yugoslavia. And by cross-breeding, they've actually managed to give the pig an extra lumbar vertebra. It's got one more vertebra in its backbone than a wild pig. We have no idea how they did it. But because it's got the next one, you get more bacon because the pig's not. Now, modern GM technology has done nothing like that. Nothing as clever as that. But those people, five and more thousand years ago, did it. So firstly, all the stuff that we've got around us is heavily genetically modified. Secondly, Frankenstein plants. There are Frankenstein plants in every park and garden and probably in your garden too. What did Frankenstein do? He took the head from one body and grafted it onto the body of another. Well, that's behind almost all the fruit plants and ornamental flowering trees that you have in your gardens, where they take a flowering rootstock and stick a totally different plant on the top through a little graft, and if you go and have a look at a, um, a Japanese pink flowering cherry, they'll be out in about eight weeks' time in England, and you'll see that off, very often the trunk goes up, and then suddenly it goes into a narrower trunk with all the flowering branches, and that is the graft where the head was grafted onto the body. So we've always done Frankenstein, and the use of terms like that by the Daily Mail just to frighten people is an irresponsible thing to do. Because let's look at one or two of the things that GM has begun to do. Firstly, there is the production of golden rice, which was done by introducing genes from a daffodil into rice plants. There's no way that could happen in nature. But it means this. Rice is deficient in vitamin A. No one knows why, it just doesn't make it. 
Polished rice, that is. So if you eat polished rice, and many poor people eat nothing but polished rice, you have a diet that is deficient in vitamin A, and as a result, babies go blind. Hundreds of millions all around the world go blind every year because there's no vitamin A in their rice. Golden rice, as it's called, because vitamin A is a golden colour. Golden rice results from popping these two genes from a daffodil into the genome of the rice plant, and now it does produce vitamin A. Now, the 350 million children per year who, who get blind every year and have done for a long, long while, half of them are dead by their first birthday because they cannot cope with blindness. They are so socially disadvantaged. If they eat golden rice, this pale straw-coloured rice, they never get blind. And that can save hundreds of millions of children every year from blindness. I mean, it's an absolutely wonderful example of what GM could do. So, handled sensibly, GM technology could give us enormous benefits. Handled stupidly, and with an eye for a fast buck, and it does nobody any good at all. There is no evidence that genetically modified food could ever harm people, which is not to say it may be totally without risks. But then there are no risk-free technologies. Ships catch fire, ships sink, motor cars crash, motorists get killed, people fall through windows and die because of the lacerations. They cut themselves with the kitchen knives, they fall downstairs. If you were going to have a system where, uh, where you ban anything if it might cause a problem, You'd ban all of those for a start. Certainly you could never introduce the glass window in the modern world. Look at the health and safety implications of that. So we need to balance the risks against the benefits. And so far the risks of GM seem to be almost unimaginably small to the point of being non-existent in terms of risks to human health. But the potential benefits are enormous. And if we could get the, the big business, unintelligent plunging ahead like a bull in a china shop approach and kill it off and replace it with thoughtful, careful planning, then I think GM could be a wonderful and extraordinarily new form of technology. Now that surprised you, didn't it? Um, the recent news on cloning, the, the stuff that's just been in the newspaper, I think cloning for stem cells is an absolutely first-rate idea because they're not making a human fetus, they're not, as it were, taking a human. We, as, as adult human beings, have an extraordinarily ad ambivalent attitude to fetuses and embryos. If we decide that it suits our interests, we can destroy as many embryos through abortion as we wish. We can destroy fetuses through abortion. Indeed, it's only in recent times that they have begun to limit the date of late abortions because they used to abort children and, and they were children they were breathing and blinking and looking and crying they used to abort babies at a date that was later than the date at which if they were born prematurely they would survive and that is to my mind a quite extraordinary thing i mean again when we were all little abortion was completely illegal um, and now it's available uh, on demand the people willingly kill babies for personal convenience without without batting an eye. But the point about cloning is that you could start with what is really just the early microbe that's going to become a human, and there's no point in pretending that, that this must be human life, or every ejaculated sperm is a, a catastrophic tragedy. I mean, it's, it's a bizarre idea. This is just a tiny group of cells that could become a human eventually, but it certainly isn't a functioning human being now. And if you could clone those, you could actually produce cells that you could put into, say, the neck of people who'd had a severed spine, and possibly join the spine up again. Or people who'd had grossly disfiguring diseases and possibly get them to grow new skin. So, um, of course, we should not be tampering with human life in any real sense. And I am astonished at the way in which abortion just swept the board and has been used in many countries really surprisingly late. I find that uh, very difficult to stomach. But the use of early embryos, when they're just little bunches of cells, and when under the microscope, you wouldn't know whether this was going to give rise to a sea urchin or a flower or a human. But to clone those cells, to be able to produce cell lines that could save disease, seems to me an absolutely first-rate piece of research. And the religious proclamations that were, that were made, saying how this was, you know, walking in darkness, the most dreadful thing, I can't begin to accept. It's an extremely useful technique. But of course, nobody reckless should be allowed to go around and clone embryos and pop them into wounds. 
there has been the notion of baby, whole babies being cloned. And you remember that novel, don't you, about the boys from Brazil when somebody cloned Hitler. Well, of course, you might clone Hitler, but that doesn't mean to say that you're going to clone dictators. What made Hitler Hitler was his upbringing and a rather quirky style with the use of the razor. Just because you claimed him, he wouldn't grow up to be a malevolent dictator. He would have different experiences and be a different person. Yeah. So cloning humans is very problematical. As Dolly the Sheep showed, she had many clinical problems when she was born. And she was only, only successfully conceived after, I think, over 360 trials. So cloning is a risky business, not a reliable business, and should certainly not be used for humans. And these people like the, uh, the Raelian sect and this chap in Italy who recently claimed they cloned babies, I don't believe they had. Because they were in the papers for saying they'd done so, but we haven't seen the baby. Um, but cloning early stem cells is, I think, a, 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 an idea that properly controlled and regulated could give us enormous medical benefits, and I think it would be silly to say otherwise. You mean the, the storing of bodies? Cryogenics, in the sense of, um, you know, freezing tissues, is very widely used. And you can certainly freeze dry bacteria and seeds, and they will last forever. Well, I mean, we don't have to know forever, because we haven't been doing it long enough. But you can examine after decades, and there's no discernible change. But it was Walt Disney who was alleged to want to have his body cryogenically preserved so that they would uh, replace his blood with antifreeze and then lower the temperature of his body down to liquid nitrogen and then they would keep him secure and frozen in exactly the same medical state as he was on the day he died. Then you could re-inject some blood and warm him up because now they have discovered a cure for what he was dying of. And you would then cure it and he'd jump up and rub his eyes and say, goodness me, just like a character out of one of his cartoon films. Well, no, it can't work. The main reason it can't work is because, as we all know, ice expands when it freezes. And what it does to copper pipes and aluminium milk bottle tops, it also does to human cells. And every cell that freezes bursts and is destroyed irrevocably. So there's really no question of it. Theoretically speaking, you could preserve a human for an indefinite length of time, yes, you could. So one of these days, something like it might happen. But at the moment, it's nothing but pie in the sky. And, and so, no, it, uh, it isn't going to happen on the basis of, of, of present technologies. Although some people, if, if you go to the company in America that does this cryogenic preservation, they're rather good. They offer you two options. You have the whole body preserved, or just the head. And the idea is that if the head is preserved, which is much cheaper, something like, I don't know, uh, half a million dollars instead of five million dollars. If you keep the head, then the idea would be that, don't be very serious, the idea would be that when they cured your disease or found an answer to what you died of, they would revive your head, take a newly dead body, graft the one on the other, shake you by the hand and ask for the check. So we've time, now we mustn't clash with bingo. I am well aware of the cultural significance of bingo, and particularly its importance to people who got almost to Calling House last time, and are longing to get their pounds back from Fred Olsen, a, a, a feeling with which I have every sympathy. So, we'll have just one more, if we may, sir. Yes, global warming is the, si the most single serious problem that we face. We've all seen the, the weather change in our lifetimes. That's never happened in the history of the world. Things take tens of thousands of years to happen. We've seen it happening in a couple of decades. Carbon dioxide is a very rare gas in the atmosphere. Uh, who's going to call out for me, please, after nitrogen, which is uh, about 80%, and oxygen, which is about 20%, uh, and, and not carbon dioxide, uh, not um, uh, water vapor? Who can call out the third commonest gas in the atmosphere? It makes up 1% of the air. The gas hardly anybody ever hears of. No? Who said argon? Good. There are. We have four people in the audience who said argon. Yes, it is. 1% of the atmosphere is argon. It's the stuff in these lights. They, they fill the bulbs with argon because it stops the uh, filament from oxidizing. And yet we hardly ever hear about argon. 
It's quite extraordinary. But there's only one part in 3,000 of carbon dioxide in the air. 1% of argon. And CO2 is a very rare gas. So when you look at a car which is transforming every litre of gasoline into 63 litres of CO2, you can see the very disruptive effect we're having because CO2 is a potent greenhouse gas. It stops heat received from the sun from escaping from the earth. And yes, uh, it is causing problems. The nation of Tuvalu is currently being evacuated because it's a low-lying coral country and uh, in the Pacific, and th the seas are invading. Incidentally, the seas are not going up. This is a really interesting fact, uh, which hardly anybody seems to realize. The seas are not rising because of melting ice, which almost everybody seems to think they are. The seas are melting because they're getting warmer and expanding like the alcohol or mercury in a thermometer. The seas are actually getting bigger as they heat up. That's the mechanism for the rising of the sea. Um, but global warming is already causing mosquitoes, like Aedes aegypti, which is now spreading in uh, America. And a lot of diseases are now being spread by insect vectors that are now spreading themselves and therefore carrying diseases over to wider areas of places. There are areas where traditional farming is no longer possible because the rainfall level has gone below a critical limit or the ambient temperature has gone above a critical threshold. And whole nations at the moment are having their way of life and their traditions decimated. Uh, it is a colossal problem. And the only reason there's no firm action over it is because of the fact that governments are locked into their you know, oil revenue friends who don't want them to discourage the use of oil. But I will leave... We'll close on this. Uh, I will leave one little thought for you, and that is that when President Clinton ended his reign, he said they would sign the Kyoto Protocol to limit the amount of CO2 produced by the great nations of the world. When President Bush came in, he reneged on the deal and said they would not cut back the amount of CO2 they produced because it would interfere with the American economy. However, the effect of the Bush administration has been so bad on the American economy that the amount of CO2 they have produced has gone down by nearly 2% anyway through, through financial mismanagement. So in actual fact, they have been fitting the Kyoto Protocol limits, but accidentally, which I know you'll think is a very pleasant thought. Now, I want to thank you, and I also want to mention the RNLI tickets. They will be available for you to buy as you pass through from here towards Bingo. Um, so the, the tickets are still available for those who couldn't get them earlier. And what I want to say is that this is my last event. How oh, bum, I'm just getting to get to like this. Is just to say how nice it's been to meet so many of you and to make so many new friends. And I hope to see you um, again. I dare say our paths will cross, it often happens. Uh, when you do get home next week, I hope that your house is in the state in which you hope it is. I hope the house plants haven't either dried out or rotted away. And that the dog doesn't ignore you too long when you reclaim it and bring it back home. Um, it's been lovely knowing you all, and I hope very much that you have enjoyed these talks. Just a tiny little fraction as much as I have really enjoyed giving them. Thank you, and bless you all.